Yes, basic psychological need number three, belonging, also known as relatedness. Uh, and if you want to write down what the definition of belonging is, it is the feeling or perception that one is engaged in an activity that brings them closer to people who share their values. And the opposite of that is probably the icky and most gross feeling of all, feeling isolated and alone. Feeling like you are, something is inherently wrong with you, that you would not belong somewhere. Um, this, Nick Winkleman calls belonging the glue that holds the other psychological needs together. Like it's so foundational and important. Interestingly enough, it's really weird that the data on how belonging shows up in self-determination theory studies is basically if all three psychological needs are being met, autonomy is the one that shows the strongest. But if this one doesn't get met, then none of them matter. Like, this is, the, this is the first one, and as soon as you cross the threshold into belonging, or at least not feeling isolated, then the other ones take over. But if you're not meeting this, the rest of them don't matter. Belonging, I, I, I think, is the thing that most people are seeking when they're seeking change. Getting from point A to point not A means finding some other people who share the values that are driving me away from this place in the first place. That moment of going, something's not right, I need to go find a place to learn what is. I need to go find another community to show me the way to point me. I, I, that's what I think is happening when people are seeking belong or seeking change at all, is seeking a place of belonging. Um, is one, one of my clients reported, told me when, about our class, she said, I come here because this feels like home. And she was talking about an exercise class. Like that, that meant something. Like, and she said it crying, so that clearly meant something. Um, that feeling that you're around other people who get you, other people who understand your problems and understand the things you're working on and understand your struggles is so powerful and I think is at the heart of almost all inten what we call intentional communities. The people who are came, come together because they share a problem to keep each other focused on the process. Um, so what, what we call intentional communities. And I, I, I guess I'm trying to oversell this a lot, but I think, because I, I think it's so important, but this is why groups work better. This is why community is so powerful, is because people feel like they belong. Um, they feel like they're in with other people who get them. Um, So group think, what you just described, that like one person starts doing it and then everyone starts sharing it out. Group think is a force of nature. It is something that happens, like entropy. People start thinking like other people around them when they think that that's how you're supposed to fit in. When one person starts doing it and it's like, oh, everyone starts doing it, that one part has a pity party, and then everyone starts having a pity party, then I guess I'm, this is the pity party place. I guess this is how we do things here. Group think is a real force of nature that we can use for good, or if we let it go, can be used for ill. Because what you just described is a place where groupthink has taught everyone an external locus of control. It has taught everyone learned helplessness. But we can use groupthink to teach the other way if we keep steering the conversation. It's not like you put everyone together in a community and then things magically work out. Because you can put everyone doing, into a situation and things get really bad really fast. Mob think is a thing. It's bad. But we can use group think as a force for good. Also known as a new normal. Teaching people a new normal. Um, by using the skills of group think. I mean, by using the force of nature called group think. Um, the that situation where a bunch of people are having a pity party, all it takes is one person to jump in and go, but now what? But how are you going to? 
but, and then following up with the internal locus of control questions. What did you learn from that cake? Like, it just takes one person to steer that conversation back to the values of an internal locus of control. So the values of, is, yes, cake is delicious. Cake is awesome. And how do we integrate cake into our lives? Like, to steer the conversation back to the values that brought the group back together. That new normal. Does that make sense? All it takes is a strong leader. Hey, guess what? You're all leaders in that situation. To jump in and go, but how are we going to get there? To, to bring the conversation back to an internal locus of control. Um, when people describe the most, when people describe the real story of how change works, when I say the real story, I mean, ask anyone who's made a major change in their life. The story is basically, I knew things weren't right. I met someone who showed me a new way of thinking. And then I met a whole community of other people who had the problems that I had, who kept me focused on what mattered. And now I feel, and then I really learned something deep and important about myself. And now I feel utterly compelled to tell other people. That's the real story of how change works. No one pulls, it, people rarely change themselves. But intentional communities that, inf, that teach people a new way of thinking change people all the time without us even knowing we're being changed. I lost 60 pounds in 292 days. And actually, I pitched a TED talk once that said, I lost 60 pounds in 292 days. And if what you're expecting is a story about struggle, sacrifice, and willpower, then you've been sold something. Because that's not how change works. Because the reality was, I met some people who thought differently than I thought, started hanging out with them a bunch, and then they slowly started calling me out on little things about my food and, and exercise habits. I changed them and lost 60 pounds without even ever having to struggle. Like, I just made new friends. Yes, I had to, like, make decisions. There was an internal locus of control, and I had to not do stuff that I enjoyed doing before. But I didn't think of it that way. It wasn't sacrifice. Because it was like, oh, yeah, this is just how we do things here. This is just what this new normal is. And, oh, I like jujitsu, so I'll go to jujitsu classes. That seems fun. And it was fun. It was hard, like physically, but it was fun. And then slowly, I just sort of changed. Ask any of your clients who've lost a fuck ton of weight, or ask anyone who's lost a fuck ton of weight. It's basically the same story. Um, are you laughing at the fuck ton part, or do you have an example? Uh, uh, the units of measurement that I choose to use? Yes. Um, it's a metric fuck ton. A metric fuck ton in Canada. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. I know imperial units are weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's how powerful this part of the hot tub is is it's people are constantly seeking this feeling of belonging and will change our behavior in subtle ways will change our very habits and the environment and everything about our lives slowly without even noticing that we're doing it like that's how awesome this is um and was the realization that I made in grad school when I was like, oh shit, the reason why people can't make themselves do things is because no one can make themselves do anything. We have to join communities to teach us how to do this stuff. That's the magic sauce. That's the thing. Like every, every, if you look at anyone who's made a major change in their life, they have a community of support around them that helped them make that change. Or they had a community that was so vile to them that they were driven away from it to get out of there to find another community. Like, those are the two conditions, but they always involve other people. They always involve, because we're social, a social psychology. Um, this part that I'm kind of talking about next is neat, because it's uh, new to us, and we're just playing around with it. So it's, it's, this, this part's fun. Um, the way that people know they belong someplace is stories. That's the glue. Because humans are social and we're narrative. We hear stories and we attach ourselves to those stories. Um, when I asked Dan, what would you do with a client who couldn't do anything? And he told me 90% of the time that he would spend with them was telling stories of other people like them. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then you go, wait a minute. 
Dan John had a Fulbright scholarship to study the power of storytelling in Turkey. Like, that's a thing, that whole Joseph Campbell monomyth. Um, and the story that I started out telling you guys of organismic integration eerily maps to the Joseph Campbell monomyth. Um, I don't know, actually, I'm going to pause right here. How deep do you want to go on the storytelling thing? One through five. Do you want to like, hear some basics about how to talk to your clients and tell them stories? Or do you want me to give you an eight-part framework for framing everything into a story that is immediately compelling? OK, great. Let's do that one. You want a fuck ton of that. Great. What I'm about to tell you is my, the thing I'm most excited about playing around with right now. And holy shit, is, does, does it work in the most fun ways? Um, I'm about to tell you what is called the Joseph Campbell monomyth, the, the one story that almost all myth maps to, the universal human story. And I love the nodding. That means it's, that you've heard of this before. That's great. When I realized that the Joseph Campbell monomyth eerily maps to the like, organismic integration and eerily maps to the stages of change, like, oh my God, this is a universal story because it maps to a universal human like, internal narrative. Wow, that was so cool. Call to adventure. That moment in uh, Star Wars, when, in the new Star Wars, when Rey realizes that she can't sell the robot and she doesn't know why. Or the moment that, the moment that, what's that? Red pill, blue pill. Red pill, blue pill in the Matrix. Uh, when um, <laughs> Katniss Everdeen uh, volunteers as tribute. Like, this is a universal story. Um, but there's always a call to adventure. There's always a sense of there is more to being me than I am currently doing. This is not who I am. I'm, there is more to this. There is a point B to, to this journey. Means that there has to be a call to something greater. There has to be a call to something greater. And then there has to be a refusal of the call because the call is too great. The ask is too much. The world is too safe. Because you're afraid of what you might be leaving behind. This was a big realization for me when I was talking to Mark Schneider of the Movement Minneapolis, who is a grief counselor. And he said one of the things that he does with clients is you can't just be all super hopeful and optimistic. You actually have to help them mourn the person they're leaving behind, to mourn the person they were, and to tell them that that person was never wrong or broken or bad. It, this is just a new, a new person. So you actually have to be aware of the fact that they had doubts and they're going to have doubts. And this is a great way to show up in the story that you're telling people about what change is going to be like, to say, to ask them, what were some of the doubts that you had before you made this decision, before you decided to join this gym? What were some of the doubts that you had before you learned to pick up heavy things? And get them to share that story with each other? Like, just ask that one day in a class. Before you joined the gym, what were some of the doubts that went through your mind? People will, people will light up and share, and then everyone else in the class will be like, I had those doubts too. Holy shit, I belong here. This is a magic tool. I've been doing this in some test groups, and it's a, this is my favorite question so far, is what doubts did you have before you joined this program? Did I get that from you? Did you come up with that one? Okay. Yeah, Omar did it. Um, this moment in Star Wars is when Luke says, oh, no, I can't. My, i got to help my uncle with the, with the water harvest. Like, it's, it's the stories in every, th th that moment's in every story, the refusal of the call. Meeting the mentor. The white rabbit. Obi-Wan. Morpheus. Morpheus. Yeah, Morpheus, thank you. These are the mentors. Um, this is the most important realization I've had in telling this story a bunch of times. It's really, it's really, like, it seems to make sense that the mentor in this situation would be the coach, right? 
No. I've been making that mistake for a while. The mentor is usually someone they've already met along the way. It's one of their friends, usually, who got healthy. One of their, whoever referred them to the gym is usually the mentor. Um, you don't want to be the mentor, because remember, Obi-Wan dies. <laughs> like, the men, the, the, you can't be the mentor. You're an ally along the way. You're a Sherpa, but you can't be the mentor. And the mentor is usually a friend, someone else who's more like them than you are. We, started, we introduced the concept of habitry guides when we realized we were fucking this up. Because people didn't trust us, but they trusted... They, they saw us as, like, gurus instead of mentors. And so we had to introduce peers that were like them to help teach this stuff faster. And, man, that worked really well. So remember, if you're telling the story, if you're trying to help people learn about that really they do belong here, that the, uh, the, the, the mentors, whoever taught them that health and that change was possible, whoever showed them that it, they could do it. So when you're casting that story, remember that the mentor is not you. It's a mistake I've made a lot. And any time that someone says they're their mentor, they're usually selling you something you don't want to buy. Also learned that too. Um, Crossing the threshold. Red pill, blue pill. Crossing the threshold, leaving Tatooine. Crossing the threshold is taking the step into the new world. Taking the step into the unknown. And in this case is a really easy one. We know exactly what it is, is just joining the gym. Like taking that step into that new world where they don't know the language, they don't know what's gonna happen, they don't know how they're going to be tested, it's a totally new and weird place. This is the gym. Or the nutrition program that you run. Or the online community that you have. Like, the community is the, is the thing you're crossing the threshold into. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you how to like, connect all these things into an easy like, story that you can just practice over and over and over again. Um, but I want to get through all the steps. Sense. Okay. A road of trials. And the quest and the journey, this is like the meat of the story. Like this is where all the, like the battle, like the, the little battles happen along the way. Um, but the important thing that happens along this is meeting friends and, and, and learning to wield tools. We're the friends. We're the allies. And the tools are the tools or the skills that we're teaching them. The habits. The, habits, the movements. The the tricks, the tips, the techniques. The lightsaber, if you will. Like this, this is the, this is the part where, this is the meat of the story. This is where most of the stuff is happening when we're working with clients. Um, and this is the, the part of the story where we keep, get to keep reinforcing their autonomy. Where we keep, we keep get to saying, you're on this journey and I am here to help you along but I'm not dragging you across the threshold. Like, I'm not pulling you across. This is your journey and you're in charge. A sacred or grand battle. This, everyone frames as a different story, I mean, I mean, the Star Wars example is the like, like fight with Darth Vader. Like, it's pretty obvious. Um, so the whole thing's building up to. Um, but when in terms of our clients, it's usually something like st like struggling with a piece of awareness they didn't have, like learning something like they didn't. They, they had a personal block. Something was in their own way, and they had to learn. They had to figure out what that was. I think it's maybe like figuring out what their point of view was. Usually or that they didn't actually have a point B at all. Like, that they really just were looking for belonging, or that this is, that it was the process itself that mattered. Um, that's actually the, yeah. What's that? Oh, we're saying point B. No. No. Usually, they end up with one. 
like when they first start, when you first start working with a client, they'll tell you that they have one, but it's usually a lie that they've told themselves. My favorite example is, I want to run a marathon. No one actually wants to run a marathon. Marathons are terrible. They hurt. Everyone wants to be the kind of person who ran a marathon. They want that identity. They don't want to actually run that marathon. And usually what happens along the way of them like learning and training to run the marathon is they learn they never really wanted to learn it in the first place, but they wanted to be the kind of person who ran a marathon, which in their mind was a disciplined person, a consistent person. And once they learn that about, like the big moment is when they go, oh, I can have all those things without this thing that I don't actually really want. I don't actually want to run this marathon. And most of the time, that's actually an epiphany for them. They go, oh, I am a consistent person. I am a disciplined person because I've been coming to the gym. I've been doing the training. Then that's what they wanted was to have that process and that sense of belonging. But they didn't actually want that point B. It wasn't actually what their goal was. Um, and that happens 98% mm, of the time with people who are just coming off the street who are like, I want to look good naked. Like really what they want, I'm, I mean, you can't tell them this. They have to learn it for themselves is they really want a sense of purpose and a sense of mastery over their body, over their environment, over their life. And we give that to them by teaching them the skills we know. But in the, rea the reality is they don't often, like they usually just want to be okay with themselves. Like it's not, a, that's actually what the atonement is. This is and, and Joseph Campbell is called the atonement with the father, but it doesn't have to be with the father. It's that moment where they go, Oh, I was not a terrible and broken person before. And this journey has just taught me a new way of thinking about the world. In this moment in Star Wars that's so powerful is, is when Luke says, I'm a Jedi like my father before me. When he has actually bridged the gap between the fact that Anakin was both he, that his father was Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader. And that he was not wrong. Like, there was nothing shameful about himself before. And he had to learn that his father was redeemed and that this was okay. And that he was an okay person. What this looks like for clients is usually something along the lines of, I was not, I thought I was a fat person. But I was not. And, I, and that, well, how I was before was Okay. I've just learned that I'm okay, and this, is, and this is fine. And now I don't have that weight on me anymore of being a broken person, of being a failed person, of being a less than person. Like the most powerful breakthroughs I've had with clients have been something along the lines of that. Like, oh, I was okay all the time. Or the moment in, in uh, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, you had the power to get home to Kansas all along. Like, that is a big moment for people when they go, I, all that guilt and shame that, dro that brought me to the gym, that brought me to this community, was misplaced because I'm, I was not a shameful and broken person. I just didn't know this thing about myself. And that's a, yeah, moment for a lot of people. And here's the weird thing. It takes six to nine months. It happens, like, really consistently. It's six to nine months of being in this hot tub of autonomy, competence, and belonging. It's like weirdly clockworky if they if you keep that environment safe. Um, put these last two together because I think this is the most often missed steps. Most people, so the, the hero's journey is a circle. The hero's journey is about separation, initiation, and return. Like the hero goes back. At the end, the, 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 the Lord of the Rings, they go back to the Shire. Like there's always a return back. Um, there's always a return back with this jewel, this piece of knowledge that they, have, they feel compelled to pass on. There has to be a new Jedi. 
Like th th there's this constant sense of having to pay it forward in of this constant sense of evangelism in a way. Like I've learned this new way of thinking about the world and I feel compelled to tell you. I feel compelled to live that way. Um, and the thing, I think most people get stuck here in this part of the story. Most people in a, in a gym, when they learn that like this is a safe space and this is a community that I can be, where I can feel like myself and I belong, they actually say, I don't want to talk about this stuff outside of here because you guys get me. You guys get that. Have you heard that before when other people have experienced some sort of change? Like, you guys get me here. I don't want to talk about, like, vegetables and stuff outside. So most people in our, in our gyms, in our communities are here, and they're like, I don't want to tell anyone else about this awesome thing. I don't want to talk, like, I don't want to talk about my values, the values that we all share with, new, with the old people from my old world. But I think that's setting them up for a giant potential fail because they live in that world. They don't live in this one. And by that I mean they're going to have to go out to eat with their friends at some point. They're going to have to be at a bar with their friends at some point. That'd be tricky. Um, this is, like, you, we have to give them the tools to return to the, back to their old world Otherwise, we're just waiting for them to fail, feel shameful, and not come back, which happens a lot when they screw up. Screw up. I'm putting that in quotes. But actually asking them, we were talking at, the, at lunch about working with people who are trying to gain weight, like the hard gainers, and most of my job when I was working with those people was actually doing role plays when their friends would ask them what the fuck they were eating that for. Because if you're trying to put on weight and you have to eat chicken nuggets at the gym because you constantly have to be eating, someone's going to bring it up. Someone's going to ask you a question. And, asking, and actually role-playing with, what are you going to say when someone says that, is a fantastic tool to keep them on track. The most popular articles I've written for my fitness pal that have been shared like 50,000 times are about this are about what do, you say with your, what do you say when people call you out for eating the way you're eating? What do you say when, to new people when you've joined a gym? Like, actually role-playing those tools, because I think this is a super neglected part of this sense of, of, of making people more resilient and feeling like they belong with us. And then there's the return with the boon, or return with the jewel, or the, the piece of knowledge that you learned in this part of the phase which for most people is something like, I feel compelled to tell you about this thing that I've learned. I feel compelled to tell you that it doesn't have to be an exercise hair shirt, that you can take it easy, that you can just do the reasonable stuff and then you'll, it'll be enough and you'll change. Like, that reasonableness is a hard learned thing for most people. Reasonable, as Dan says, People have to fuck up a whole lot in their life before they learn that reasonableness is the answer. And that's what this is. This journey of learning to fuck, of fucking up so many times that you go, wait a minute. Being reasonable actually gets me more progress than anything else. That's not a story that people can let's like hear and go, yeah, reasonableness, that's totally the answer. Because of, <laughs> like, how many times has that ever worked? Like, oh yeah, I should totally be reasonable. Mm-mm. They need to hear it in this narrative. They need to hear it in this story from other clients, from other people in the gym, from other people that you work with, to keep hearing it over and over and over again. We call it constantly telling them the story of their pending success, constantly telling them this story in this framework and getting eliciting it from them in a way that makes them realize that, it's, that, it's, that they're on the right path. And the tools that we, I mean, have just started playing around with, this is all super fun and new stuff, is asking them very specific questions that map to these, but we kind of don't know when to ask them yet. We're still, like, learning when that is. But we've got these down right now. Like, I feel really strong about these, and I feel really strong about this one when they're in it. Um, asking people what are you excited about when they just join. Asking people what seems fun, what's compelling, 
is a really great way to get them to talk about like the sense of adventure that's coming up. It's just literally asking, what, what's exciting you about this program? What's exciting you about joining the gym? And, and framing it in a way that's fun instead of a way that is like going to be work. Instead of asking people what's the first habit you want to, what's the habit that you think will give you the most results, asking what's the habit that seems like it would be the most fun is a really like neat reframing. And then the question we ask here, I just told you guys, which is, uh, what doubts did you have before you joined? Like that's a really, that one is working really well in our groups. Um, I kind of don't know what to do with that one. That one's new, but it's, just, it's an important part. Like tell me about who else you met, who else in, in your life that you've learned this stuff from. That's, that's kind of helpful. But we're still learning how to do this. Um, but we know there's a lot, that this is a really powerful tool that we're just trying to figure out how to wield right now. It's the lightsaber we don't quite know how to work, but we're, we're getting there real fast. I feel excited about it. Um, the most, like the, the super quick and dirty, how do you get this, is asking people to tell the story like when they have any sort of success, any sort of moment of awareness, any sort of like, ah, oh, aha moment, ask them to tell you a story. Ask them to tell you about it and get it in their own words, record it. And this is not just a testimonial for them. It's a testimonial for, it's not just a testimonial for you. It's a tool for them. You're giving them a gift to tell this story. You're also giving it a, as a gift to the other people who are in your community to hear it. Because this is the things that they constantly need to be hearing to let them know they're in the right place. That this is a journey that's going to matter. That this is a higher sense of purpose that they have. Does that make sense? Because I just threw like the wooeyest stuff at you. Well, that's no, not wooey. It's really fun, um, but it it just keeps working. That's the that's the cool part. Is like every time you hear the the, the client stories, like when they tell stories to each other, it maps to this. It maps to separation, initiation, return. This is how things were. This is what changed, and this is how they're different. That's narrative storytelling. Everyone tells stories this way. This is it's just a super cool toolkit to be able to pull stories out of people in this way and then package them up and give them back to them or package them up and give them back to them to share with the other people in their lives. When people tell the stories of their pending success, it maps to this narrative story, like every time. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a way to elicit it. You missed the beginning. We're trying to figure out a way to elicit it out of people in a more consistent way repetitive way um, that we can, well, we can replicate. And this is, I don't know, this is the thing we're most I'm most obsessed with right now. So this is just me being like excited and telling you and going, I don't know what it does yet, but it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, just getting people, to, like putting people through the reps of it, like asking people, hey, Omar, you had a really great success. Would you mind telling Kate about it? Like, Literally just asking people to tell their stories. People love telling their stories usually if they feel like they're in a safe space to share them. So just putting people through those reps is really good practice. But the biggest thing that, that we've been using it for is as soon as people have a moment, ask them to tell the story and record it. Get them to write it. Like anything you can do to get them to get that story out and on into a permanent way. Um, and putting it up in a, in a place, if, they have, if you have permission to share it, putting it up in a place where other people on the journey can see it. This is kind of a meh moment for most people when they go, wow, I don't want to run the marathon. What the fuck do I want? <laughs> yeah, like that's, Wait a minute. Damn it. I don't care. Like I just like hanging out with you guys and picking up heavy shit. What is, does that mean I'm broken or wrong in some way? Because the world is telling me that I'm supposed to want something, but I don't care. And then everyone going, yeah, we don't care either. It seems cool, you know? Like, it doesn't mean you're broken. It means you're cool. Yeah. Like, just letting go of outcome in general seems to be, like, a big atonement for a, a lot of people. Letting go of the thing that you, like, you have to want something. Like, no, you can just like picking up heavy stuff. That's cool, too. Okay, I want to give you guys some, like, real practical stuff you can use for belonging. So we're going to, I'm going to move on from this and give you like four quick tips, then I feel like I'm actually giving you some cool tools. Well, first one is kind of like, well, duh. Um, I, 
I had a client just like you. And then tell them the story of that client. Like that's the most useful tool for giving a sense of people, giving people a sense of belonging. Is even if you only work one on one, you have the stories of your other clients. That you can make them sense, like make them feel like they belong to something bigger. If you tell them about the other clients who had who shared their, who they're following in their footsteps. Um, Dan often tells me, don't forget the vertical community. Like, don't forget to tell the way you learned this stuff. Like, if you're, the, if you're bringing back the jewel to them, tell them where you got it. And Dan says, he always tells people, I learned this from Dick Knottmeyer. Dick Knottmeyer learned it from this person. Martial arts does a great job of this. That you, you have a pedig your belt has a pedigree, and everyone knows those stories. So telling people, giving people a sense of history to it. Um, let's put, put this up. Vertical community, sense of history. You know, this is not just, this is not just picking up heavy shit. This is, you know, Hercules was doing this stuff. You know, giving people a sense that they were tied to something bigger is a way of giving people a sense of belonging and showing them values that they, that they're deeper and bigger than just, I want to look good naked. Um, it's just a, and you can do it casually. You don't have to make it a big deal. You know, tell them, tell them that people have been doing strength training for thousands of years. You just connected them to history in a like casual way that also gives what you're saying more weight. Like you can do it in a quick, casual, easy way. You don't have to make it a big deal. If you're like me and you like telling really like stories about ancient Greece and stuff like that, then do it. But if that's not your thing, you don't have to. But you can still get the same effect. Shared common rituals. Whoa, Nelly. Like, does that have a quick impact on stuff? A ritual to the warm up. We, you do the same warm up, so people kind of get the sense of, like, oh, I'm in the right place. This is what we do. I have this, like, we go through the same steps together. Bikram yoga is the exact same process, like, is the exact same program every single time. Um, for a while at Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, we experimented with doing the exact same workout for six straight weeks. And it was really, like, it was really cool to have that, that sense of doing the same things. So eventually, it just worked out to be just the same warm-up every time because we got bored. But having a ritual there was really cool. Um, and it can be one stupid, the stupid ritual from Coyote Point Kettlebell Club was that stupid joke about I'm impressed. Dan would tell that at the beginning of everything. Like, I mean, anytime there was someone new, he would tell that joke. And that became a ritual. Like Dan's going to tell this stupid ass joke, and that was the ritual that that we all knew we belonged because we knew that joke was coming. That stupid thing made we made it feel like we really but were in the right place. We all ate together at the end of the Kaido Point Kettlebell Club. In fact, if you go to Dan's garage and you train with Dan, you go to lunch. Like that's part of the gig. Like you do it. Um, it's part of the ritual itself. As we train and we eat. Well, we, we he calls it feasting, but. Now, again, vertical community, like a sense of feast, is a bigger meaning than just getting lunch together. Um, but having ritual, they don't have to be, you know, you don't have to make up a powerful meaning behind the ritual. It can just be, this is how we do things here. Like, that's the ritual. Um, but it really anchors people to a sense of place. Um, I was going to say... Uh, Shared common superordinates. I call everyone in our forum motivators. Your motivator. It's a common word to describe everyone in, this, in the community. Mark Fisher is ninjas. He calls all his clients ninjas. Almost every CrossFit calls everyone athletes, even though most of them are not. It is a shared common superordinate. A thing that we all call each other that means something, that means that we're more than just ourselves. It's a sense of grander mission. I can promise you the, sh the, the best superordinate is the one they come up with, is when they start spontaneously calling each other because it reflects their values and reflects your values. So don't force it. It just kind of happens. But if you notice it, fuck yeah, start using it. This is, um, when I was a 
Marine Corps officer candidate, this was everything. Like, I was, everything was doing to be a Marine. Like, what did that mean? I don't know, Marine stuff. Like, it becomes its own circular logic. The shared common superordinate becomes the very embodiment of the values. Like, what is a, what is a Marine? A Marine is the one who does Marine things? Like, it, it just goes in a loop. So, this is, this is a super powerful tool. If, people start, if you can start wielding it, 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 it works really well. There, some quick belonging tips. Um, also, I'm moving fast because I know we're wrapping up and I'm trying to like, keep the energy high on the way. Like I'm sprinting to the finish at this point. Um, the fastest way I've seen people fuck this up, make people feel isolated, is also the scariest thing I've seen. Uh, I was watching a personal trainer and their client, just observing, and the personal trainer started telling a story about another client they had, talking shit about the other client. And like they thought they were doing it as a way of like, oh, you're not like this, so I'm going to tell you this. And they thought they were doing it as a super like in thing, but the look on the client's face was basically like, you talk shit about your clients when we're not with you? It was a sense of instant, immediate betrayal and isolation. They were like, I thought I belonged, but I didn't belong. And I was like watching it in slow motion going, uh-oh. That person, I mean, after that day, that person never came back to the gym. They never signed up for another package. They were gone. Like, that was, it's just a strong sense of betrayal. And... All it was was a sense, like, the, the, the personal trainer thought that they were like, hey, we're buddy-buddy, because they just didn't see the impact that it would have in this immediate sense of betrayal. And when people talk about feeling isolated, like, when people talk about bad experiences with personal trainers, they don't leave the gym. They leave health and fitness. Like, they sprint away because they go, I guess I didn't belong in that place after all. So this is not just, this has the potential to ruin an entire generation of people. As in, if that person has kids, now they're going to tell their kids, don't bother going to the gym because you don't belong there because I don't belong. Like, it has knock-on effects that are huge. That if you're, just be really careful about the stories you tell your clients the stories you tell about your clients should be about your clients constant, constantly hearing the story of their pending success and the success of the people around them. And if there's a story about struggle, make the story about overcoming the struggle or learning something from the struggle. Don't just talk shit about your clients in front of your clients. We, 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 one of the things we talk about is that if you don't have a community that goes client to client, you still have a community that goes client to coach to client. Like, it's still a community. They're still in this circle, but they're just not, they just haven't met each other, but they're still hearing about each other. They're still, they're still in a community that shares values, but they just have never met the other people in it. Um, and I think you're all probably members of communities like that, that you, you have some shared, you, you, you know that people share your values when you find out things about them. I know that if I meet another Boy Scout, then we share some values, even though I've never talked to that person. Like, that's, that, that, there's a connection there. Um, and, yeah, that's your point. You have community already if you're working one-on-one. -on -one. You just might not know it yet. And remember earlier when we were talking about, oh, this was, this was drinks last night. Um, I was talking to Justin about saying, this is my, these are my values, and this is the way that I work with people. And when people, and using that as a filter, for people that want to work with you, that, then, they'll, then it means that you share their, they share your values. And if two people work with you, that means that you now have a community of three people with the common values. The thing they have in common is that you gave them a test, a filter, and they chose to work with you. And so now you have, and you can say, I only work with smart people. I only work with, it fill in the blank of adjective that people want to use to describe themselves. And then you have that tool to be able to say, no, I only work with good people. I only work with kind people. I only work with people who have the potential to change. You know, whatever you want to, whatever they want to hear, you can say that. Because 
you sh you have you've essentially already given them a values test by them deciding to work with you or not. Um, this is my one cardinal rule for maintaining the hot tub, for being the pool boy that maintains the hot tub. The one thing that if you keep this in mind, then everything else works out fine. I like oversimplifying things. Asterisk. Everything is optional, but this is how we do things here. Um, if, if you go into every situation with the client with this basic attitude in the back of your mind, probably work out fine. But this is how we do things here is basically saying that these are the values of this community. Um, one of the things that I've said about clients is I've never lost a client. I have a bunch of people that are on some really long breaks though. Like there is no, like you're always welcome back. It's always like you, you can always start like, like this. Today's a new day. Today's a new start. You can always go again with no judgment because um, everything is optional, including showing up. But you're still welcome. By showing up, you've proven that you're part of this. You're part of this community. You're a part of this movement. You're a part of this mission. And the attitude that I would have about the mayor not showing up is, hey, everything is optional. And when the, he comes back, he, fuck yeah, he's welcome. I can't wait to hear about what he's been doing because we're genuinely interested in that mayor shit that he does. Because one of the things that I, was like part of my values is I know I'm everyone's fifth priority and I'm fine with that. I hope I'm their fifth priority because if I come before their wife, their children, their, their job, something's fucked up. Like I need to be their fifth priority. If I'm their number one priority, their life's fucked up. Um, so the fact that he has mayor shit, I want to use as a boon to the rest of the people in the class. Be like, he's doing mayor shit. And he's, so that means that he like, struggles to get here because he's doing mayor shit. Um, and the fact that he shows up again at all is proof that this is a valuable community to him because he's willing to sacrifice some mayor shit to show up here. Like, turn that into a story about how this is, everything is optional, including showing up. But when you show up, it's proof that you belong here. And, what, and how we do things here we don't talk shit about the mayor when he doesn't show up. Like, we don't give him shit when he comes back. We say, oh man, it's so glad, I'm so glad you're back. What, what mayor shit have you been doing? Like, it's a, the, the thing that we don't do here is judge the other people of the community who share their values by showing back up. Does that, does that jive? Is that an answer to you? Okay, cool. Yeah, I can miss some days too, and I can always come back. We call it lowering the barrier to re-entry as low as you possibly can. Because the point of any session is another session. Like, the, the, well, change only happens when they come back. So don't make the stakes high on them leaving. Make the stakes low. Always be a welcoming place. And the point where, when I'm running groups for money, if people leave and they're like, this isn't working out, I thank them, I don't, I say, we're really gonna miss you, and first of all, I really wanna thank you for everything you've done for this community, for everything you've done for this group. I really, I know that Omar really appreciated it when you helped him out in this way, and like, make it about the, 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 the contributions they made to the community, and, I, and, and anytime you wanna come back, you're, oh my God, you're so welcome. In fact, here's a discount code for your first month off. So when you come back, your first month is free. And you just uh, make that my, barrier so The Habitat well, groups uh, that I was back. running um, bef uh, on, on Facebook um, before we did the app and stuff, I just was testing this out going, what happens if I give the like, discount code to come back and do the welcoming note? 75% of people who left came back within three months. Or, crazy thing, sent referrals. I had this guy who lasted two weeks in a group I was running I don't even know if it lasted two weeks. It's like 11 days. And he like, barely 
engaged at all. And I sent him this note when he left. I said, hey, I'm going to cancel. He's like, okay, cool. Sent him the note, discount code. Um, the next group I opened up, I had a referral. And someone I never heard of before. It's like, hey, how'd you find us? It's like, oh, so-and-so. It was that guy that quit. Next time, I had two more. Ended up with, like, over the course of a couple of months, five new referrals from him. So I emailed him. I said, I thought you quit. He said, oh, is that, I didn't think it was, like, I thought you hated it. He goes, I did hate it. I thought it was stupid. Like, one habit at a time, that's bullshit. That's not for me. But I know a lot of people who it's good for. No. I gave him a code for him. I didn't ask for anything. But he said, oh, no, that wasn't my values, but I know a lot of people for whom it would, it would work, and he kept talking me up. So this attitude, everything is optional, including showing up, including, like, you, you always have autonomy to make your own choices. There is no punishment. There is, there is always unconditional positive regard makes most things work. It's this like salve that you can just put on everything. Kind of like the attitude of if you go into any conversation being genuinely interested, things work out. If you go into most situations with this in the back of your mind, your community gets stronger and just kind of works. So there's your, <laughs> here, if you're going to learn anything, it's this, I hope. I think we have a whole other day tomorrow to learn more. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah. And I always, I, for me, I always take it one more and be like, yeah, every, everything's optional. Even when we do, like, hey, this is the habit. I don't want to do that habit. Great. Do your own. No big deal. But we're all going to be talking about the, ha the habit that we're all working on now. But you can do your own habit. It's cool. And we're still here for you. We just keep going. Um... I don't, I don't know how to end things, so just, I guess, there. <laughs> Yay!